Hey there, folks. Uh, this video is going to be a defense, not that it needs it, of a very, very good song that is um, very underappreciated, disregarded, even hated uh, by Dylan fans. And that song comes from this great album here, Another Side of Bob Dylan. And the song is called Ballad in Plain D. You know which one it is, don't you? Oh, yeah. Um, this song, to me, is, is a very profound portrayal of a moment in time. This time occurred in March 1964, uh, when Dylan was um, basically breaking up with his girlfriend at the time, Suze Rotolo. I don't know if it's Suze or Susie. I never did know that. But anyhow, um, it's sort of like a, a really passionate first love. And anyone who's had a passionate first love should be able to understand um, the array of emotions, um, the intensity, the anger, the regret, everything that's, you know, pouring off of these words here. Some people seem to not be able to relate to that. I'll get to that later. I'll get to some of the um, comments and the reviews by the uh, powers that be, you know, in the Dylanology world, what they have to say about it. But um, I think it's an amazing song. I will say this. Dylan indicated... Well, I'll read what he said here. When he was asked in 1985 if he had any regrets about the song, Ballad in Plain D, he replied, Oh, yeah, that one. I look back and say, man, I must have been a real schmuck to write that. I look back at that particular one and say, of all the songs I've written, maybe I could have left that alone. Well, he never did leave it alone. This album, of course, came out in 1964 been re-released many times and remastered as late as 2003 it's still there it's never been removed and i'm glad it's not because i guess i think it's a fantastic song i can understand regret for having written some of the words here as a matter of fact even within the song itself dylan is expressing regret for this evening what happened and that's what makes it real that's what makes it powerful this is a song about an, an actual thing that happened, an actual event, and all the emotions involved. That's why I think it's so good. I'm going to go through the song. All right, here, let's go with it. I once loved a girl, her skin it was bronze. With the innocence of a lamb, she was gentle like a fawn. Remember that. I courted her proudly, but now she is gone. Gone as the season she's taken. I love that last line. The absence of the person as well as absence of the time spent together. You lose that person, that friendship, that intimate relationship, but you also lose that time. That time that you spent with that person is infused with that relationship. So the loss of the person, you lose the time. I once, long time ago, encountered an old girlfriend, quite a serious girlfriend at the time. Uh, it was 15 years later after I had not seen her. And, and I um, sat and had a lunch with her. Uh, her kid played with my kid, that kind of thing. And I told my wife about it. I told her who I'd met. I just in, accidentally ran into her, but spent about an hour talking to her. And my wife said, well, do you still love, do you still have love for this person? I said, no, 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 no. But I have love for that time. That time of my life is very passionate, very, very, very important to me. Even though I don't love that person anymore, but that time. So when I, when I read about uh, in this song, uh, gone, she's gone as the season she's taken. That time is gone as well. Now, he'll always remember that time fondly, hopefully. But anyhow, powerful first verse. All right, here's the next one. Through young summer's breeze, 
I love that. That intoxication, that, that young, youthful summer's breeze, that intoxicating, magical, mystical time, that atmosphere. Through young summer's breeze, I stole her away. Now here's the first instance where he talks about obsession, rearing its ugly head, so to speak. I stole her away from her mother and sister, though close did they stay. We're talking here about uh, Mary, uh, her mother, and Carla, her sister. Each one of them suffering from the failures of their day. With strings of guilt, they tried hard to guide us. So he's expressing, obviously, some dislike of the mother and the sister here, obviously. Just saying, whether right or wrong, but in the mindset he was in at the time, he's talking about they were failures. And, uh, and they suffered because of their failures. It, it bothered them. And um, what they did was use their failures um, and um, strings of guilt. They tried hard to guide us. They're trying to live through their sister, basically, and uh, control her. And of course, you know, when you're in love with someone, the last thing you want is some somebody else being in control, control. You want independence from all other people's influence. You want to be free, you know. Okay, third verse. Of the two sisters, I love the young, Suze. With sensitive instincts, she was the creative one. Sensitive instincts, it came instinctual to her. She was a natural talent, a natural creative individual. She not only was innocent of a lamb, but gentle like a fawn, but she was creative, naturally creative. It came naturally, instinctual to her. The constant scapegoat. She was easily undone by the jealousy of others around her. She cared what other people thought. She was uh, affected by their opinions of her. I'm sure uh, Dylan could very much relate uh, to the jealousy of others around him because he was rising like a meteor, you know, I don't know if that's the word or not, but he was really rising in his his endeavors as a folk, um, you know, you know, maestro at this time. Of course, he was just really doing well. I'm sure there were a lot of jealousy <laughs> from other people who were not quite as talented as he was around him. All right, fourth stanza here. For her parasite sister, ooh, I had no respect, bound by her boredom, her pride to protect, countless visions of the other she'd reflect as a crutch for her scenes in her society. Parasite, prideful, crutch. This is very harsh portrayal of her sister indeed. And I can see him looking back at this and thinking, yeah, that was a little rough, a little rough. But you see, he's in the moment here. This is all that happens in the in one night here. Yeah. She's bored. Um, failures of the day. Um, her pride makes her basically see herself or use reflection of the natural talent of her sister upon herself. That's what he's saying here, whether that's true or not. So that she could go out amongst the society, you know, whereas she has an emptiness and, and she's tr basically living through her sister's talent, superiority, or whatever. My, and this is the next stanza here is he's already starting to show that he knows his weakness here. He knows he was wrong. Myself, for what I did, I cannot be excused. The changes I was going through can't even be used. Hey, I'm Bob freaking Dylan. In 1964, he's already a big shot. He was rising up. He says, even with all that going on, I can't be used as an excuse for my behavior here. He knows he's been an ass. He knows he's being this way. For the lies that I told her in hopes not to lose the could-be dream lover of my lifetime. This is the first of a few times he mentions dream, this sort of fantasy. You know how it is. You meet your fantasy girl. You're young. And, and you'll do anything not to lose that. He's, he's saying here, I'll, I'll tell lies. You know how it is when you're, you're presenting us something about yourself that maybe is not true, just to kind of manipulate and guide the situation so that you don't lose this, this, this 
obsessed of things that you that you can uh, uh, you know that you can obsess this 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 as he mentions here later a magnificent mantelpiece this he doesn't want to lose this you know how it is you've been there right we've all been there next verse with unknown consciousness like in a dream he's in a haze he's in he's living in a magical world I possessed in my grip a magnificent mantelpiece, though its heart being chipped. He's, he's again, I've, I've got her. She's mine. I possess her. I put her on a mantle. I display her. This is, this is, I'm so proud of being this girl's boyfriend. Though its heart being chipped, that innocence of a lamb, that um, a gentleness of a fawn, uh, the sensitive instinct, the creative personality. It's, this relationship is actually damaging to her. The heart's being chipped. It's, it's a, she's, he's wearing away at all those qualities about her. And he knows it. See, the thing is, he, he knows deep down. This is not probably not going to last. You've been there, right? I've been there. You try to make it work, and you, you, but you kind of know. Noticing not that I'd already slipped to a sin of love's false security. I think deep down, subconsciously, he knew, but he says not outwardly. I noticed not that I'd already slipped. I've already screwed this thing up. And the sin of love's false security. It's not natural to be so deluded. It's almost sinful to be that deluded. But that's, that's the way it is. Next verse. From silhouetted anger to manufactured peace, answers of emptiness, voice vacancies, till the tombstones of damage read me no questions, but please what's wrong and what's exactly the matter. Look at these words. Silhouetted, manufactured, emptiness, vacancies, tombstones. Made up. It's, it's almost like there's a there's an emptiness, there's a, a vacuity. You're passionately in love, but there's this emptiness. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. You you don't even know what it is. You can't understand what it is. Please, what's wrong and what's exactly the matter? Been there, done that. I've had a relationship like that. I know what that feels like. Voice vacancies. Out of the mouth come meaningless vacuities. The tombstones of damage. Damage has been done. Words have been said. And you just, you're just riding on what's left. The fumes of the relationship. Next verse. And so it did happen like it could have been foreseen. Deep down he knew. I knew this. The timeless explosion of fantasy's dream. This night, the clock stopped. You ever had a night like that? One of these incredibly intense nights of, of, of anger, of, of rage, of, of pain. The clock stops. Or I should say, there is no time. You could be talking, and before you know it, it's the next morning. You, all night you're doing this. The timeless explosion of fantasy's dream at the peak of the night darkness the king and the queen tumbled all down into pieces next verse the tragic figure her sister did shout leave her alone god damn you get out my sister's a tragic figure here leave her alone get out and i and my armor turning about he turns to face with rage what her sister had just said to him and nailing her to the ruins of her prettiness he's lashing out in anger he's hurt he's defeated and he knows it but instead of accepting it he just throws all of his bile right into the face of the sister like he's doing on this song the next verse Beneath a bare light bulb, the plaster did pound. Her sister and I in a screaming battleground. It's referring earlier about wearing his armor. 
his defense mechanism. Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you what a crap, per, crappy person you are. And she sues in between the victim of sound. She's having to hear all this. Soon shattered as a child neath her shadows. The once light of this beautiful relationship was becoming darkness now. She breaks just like a little girl. Next stanza. All is gone. All is gone. Mentioned twice for emphasis here. Admit it. Take flight. I gagged twice, doubled, tears blinding my sight. My mind, it was mangled. I ran into the night, leaving all of love's ashes behind me. This is a perfect and profound stanza of the moment's flood of emotions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat it. All is gone. All is gone. Admit it. Take flight. He knew. I gagged twice, doubled, tears blinding my sight. My mind, it was mangled. I ran into the night, leaving all of love's ashes behind me. He's done. The next stanza. This first line of this next stanza reminds me of Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. The wind knocks my window. The room it is wet. The words to say I'm sorry I haven't found yet. Something said in anger you can't get back. It, it's over. He doesn't even know how to apologize. I think of her often and hope whoever she's met will be fully aware of how precious she is. Profound loss and profound and real love here. He had genuine love for her. He did. He's hoping that the next person she meets will be better to her, will be better for her, and that she'll be happy. That's, that's real love. Then the final stanza, folks. Oh, my friends from the prison, they ask unto me. I think the friends from the prison are p people who are either unhappily married or unhappy couple. People he knows that are in relationships and they're not satisfied with them. I think that's what that means. I don't know. They ask unto me, how good, how good does it feel to be free? You know, the grass is always greener kind of thing. Yeah, you mean you're free, man. And I answer them most mysteriously. In other words, how can you answer that when you're in that kind of pain? How, how do you answer a question like that? And this is how he, how he answers them. Are birds free from the chains of the, high, of the skyway? Are birds free from the chains of the skyway? The chains of pain and, and other chains are usually invisible. And... Uh, Hey, you're in the sky. You're a bird in the sky. You're free. Hey, you can do your own thing. You're unshackled. You can, it's good. There's plenty of fish in the sea, they tell you, right? <laughs> when you break up with someone. They're there. I don't care. This is an amazing song. And a lot of people since Dylan has expressed some regret of having written the song have just automatically said, well, he doesn't like the song, so therefore I must not like it. I'm not going to even give it the time of day. Here's some of these half-wits. <clears throat> these are people that, these are your biographers and whatnot. Andy Gill. He writes that Ballad in Plain B is one of Dylan's least satisfying songs because it fails to amount to anything more than a self-pitying, one-sided account of the final traumatic night of Dylan's long-standing romance with Suze Rotolo. Self-pitying, one-sided account. That's true, but he's expressing those emotions, you idiot. Gill contrasts Dylan's inability to handle such personal material successfully. He contrasts that inability to Dylan's ability to wax lyrical about more abstract philosophical concerns such as the state of society and the nature of freedom. How much you want to bet Andy Gill is a half-wit? How much you want to bet he's never experienced what Dylan is ex ex explaining here in this particular? What a dingbat. Clinton Halen is another one. This is why I don't read books by these clowns anymore. He claims that Dylan wrote a rough outline of Ballin and Plain D soon after the events. In May 1968, he stayed at the Greek village of Vernilia 
working on songs for Rick's next album. There he drew out the material to the lengthy ballad he recorded in June 1964. Clinton Halen writes, It took 13 cathartic verses to get all of this out of his system without Dylan ever transcending his material. Pedestrian, whatever. You know, never, never goes anywhere. He says, Plain D remains an exercise in painful autobiography. That's all it is. Yeah, not poetic, not transcendent. It's just, you know, 13 stanzas of blah, blah, blah. What about Suze Rotolo? What does she think of it? In an interview with Victoria Balfour, Suze Rotolo sounded a forgiving note about the song. Here's what she says. People have asked how I felt about those songs that were bitter, like Ballad and Plain D, since I inspired some of those songs too. Yet I never felt hurt by them. I understood what he was doing. You know why? Because as Dylan's saying, you have sensitive instincts. You're the creative one. You understand art. You understand poetry. You understand what Dylan was doing. These other half-wits don't. Here's what else she said. I understood what he was doing. It was the end of something and we both were hurt and bitter. That's right, Clinton and Andy. His art was his outlet, his exorcism. It was healthy. That was the way he wrote out his life. The loving songs, the cynical songs, the political songs, they're all part of the way he saw his world and lived his life, period. It's amazing. The one he's writing about, who was there that painful night, who was crushed by it, as Dylan says in the song. She's saying it was healthy for him to write that song. It's art. That's who he is. That's what the song's about. Anyone who's been in that position, anyone who's been in that kind of relationship and experienced that kind of anger, rage, pain, insecurity, failure, and then regret over what was said, regret over what was done, and then expressing the love for the person and hoping for the best life that they could live. Anybody who's been that, in that position can understand this song and understand how great it is. Or you could be a music critic. Take care, folks. Fantastic song. I'd love to hear what you think. Bye-bye.